Hello and welcome to our 2.30 press conference, discoveries from real-time tracking of an underwater eruption and the future of deep sea research. Our speakers today are John Delaney, Professor of Oceanography at University of Washington, Scott Nooner, Associate Professor of Geology at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, William Wilcock, Professor of Oceanography at the University of Washington, and Julie Huber, As Associate Scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Well, I've got to tell you that I'm pretty excited about this. Some of you have known me for 25 years. We've been trying to get this whole program off the ground for a long time, and it's, it's very, very exciting to be able to talk about this with you. Um, the heart and soul of what we have built the scientific discussion around is something called the Cable Observatory, otherwise known as the Neptune System, or many other terms have been used. But it's uh, from paid for by the National Science Foundation, and it's uh, called the Ocean Observatories Initiative. It was actually mentioned uh, by John Kerry when he was down in South America uh, negotiating a few uh, agreements here not long ago. And the real-time scientific discovery in a changing ocean from anywhere on Earth is kind of the background theme. But the bottom line is, with the magic of fiber optic cables, we can be present throughout entire volumes of the ocean without actually having to be there. Indeed, if you can log on to the internet, you can actually get a live feed from this system uh, within, within a very short period of time here. So we're right at the conclusion of it. But we have a, uh, I suppose we'd call it a, a seismic leader for this, this uh, uh, adventure movie. And the seismic leader is what we're here to talk with you about. So, the National Science Foundation put together a program that's made up of, of a number of locations, uh, two in the southern hemisphere, two similar ones in the northern hemisphere, satellite-linked uh, moorings and gliders, and satellite-linked moorings and gliders on the east coast, the Pioneer Array. The one that I want to talk to you about today is this one. It's the Cabled Observatory uh, Array, and it is based on the magic of fiber optic cable. And here's the, our Canadian colleagues got in the water uh, six, eight years ago with one. And so they're not far away. We started out together back in uh, about 2000, agreeing to do the, the plate, so to speak. Uh, we then experienced 9-11 and had about a, a nine year delay, but we have just finished, in 2014, we finished putting in this part of the cable the orange part, and then each of these nodes are called primary nodes. And I'll, I'll try to explain what those are here in just a second. But in the meantime, I wanted to talk to you about axial seamount. That's that part on, on, the, uh, on the far side there. That's this one. And the reason I want to talk to you about it is uh, uh, it represents a major system on the planet. Uh, the cable is about 900 kilometers long, and it handles uh, 10 gigabits per second bandwidth, and it handles uh, a, a tremendous amount of electrical power as well. And it hosts, right now, about 140 instruments, of which about 95% are actually functioning and sending data ashore. So why axial seamount? Well, let me just uh, take you on a, a, I don't know, what would you call it, a, a satellite eye view of the planet as we look at the mid-ocean ridge system, which is 70,000 kilometer long feature running around the world like the strings on a baseball, where the seafloor is pulling apart at about the speed your fingernails grow. But axial seamount, which has been worked on for years and years by our colleagues from NOAA uh, in, in something called their VENTS program, uh, is actually located right on that 70,000 kilometer long feature. So by studying axial seamount, we are indeed studying a portion of the plate tectonic system where the plates are actually pulling apart, in this case at about six centimeters a year. And this thing, this patch right here is called a caldera. It's a depression in the top of a volcanic system. This is a kind of an artist's view of the same, that's the depression there. And we have dubbed in a major eruption. And these black smoke issues are, are fluids coming from below the seafloor all the time. These go on all the time. These kinds of things are generated by an eruption. And they're called megaplumes or event plumes. 
And uh, folks at NOAA, particularly a fellow by the name of Ed Baker, was the person who really un uncovered those and has done a tremendous amount of work. These plumes get to be quite large, and then they detach and they move away, and we don't know what the fate is, but what we do know is when eruptions take place, a massive amount of material from below the seafloor, including microbes, and uh, Julie Huber will talk to you about the, the possibility of using a system like this as a window into the, the, the deep, hot biosphere. And, and so that's part of what we're doing here. But by and large, no one has ever really very thoroughly studied an underwater volcano underwater. There have been m many studies of Iceland, which is one of the most successful volcanoes on the planet, and it's right on the mid-ocean ridge uh, in the North Atlantic. So what can a cabled system do? Let's look at, first of all, what a cabled system is. There again is the caldera up in the corner. Here's the diagram I showed you earlier, and this is the area we're going to focus on for now. There's a lot of other things going on over here where the big magnitude 9 earthquakes are, are often uh, anticipated, but uh, since uh, about 315 years, we haven't really seen one. So we're, we're on uh, pins and needles uh, waiting for something to happen here, and we're, we'll be looking at that later. Over here, however, on Axial, this is what Axial looks like. There is one of those primary nodes I told you about. This is a primary node. These orange boxes are all primary nodes. And here's a primary node is roughly equivalent to a substation in your neighborhood. Uh, it's, it, it's where all the electricity comes in and goes out to a whole neighborhood, big neighborhood. In this case, it's about a 5,000-pound, uh, uh, very sturdily built uh, system that has switching and we can control all the switches from land, but the power and the bandwidth are cycled through this kind of thing. And it's built the way it is with doors and everything in case uh, we need to shed uh, dredges that fishermen uh, periodically wander into the area. We've, we've talked with all of them ahead of time, but the hope is that we won't have that experience, but we're ready for it if it happens. Here is a, a robot on the end of a, uh, a cable from the ship, which is 1,500 meters above where this scene is taken, plugging in an underwater mateable connector, which are, it's the heart and soul of the whole program. And some, for those of you that are uh, engineeringly inclined, these are the details, but there's, for, for people that are interested in seismology and acoustics, pulse per second timing gives us microsecond uh, resolution, which is really uh, what we strove for a long time ago. Anyway, there are a lot, lots of information here uh, Again, 900 kilometers. This is a picture over in one of the experimental sites, and it shows three different instruments. Uh, the bottom pressure tilt system, which was built and uh, provided to the program by our NOAA colleagues, uh, Bill Chadwick and Scott Nooner, who is right here to my left. This is a mass spectrometer, a bit unusual to have a mass spectrometer operating at 1,500 meters water depth. And this is a sampling device uh, it's called the remote access sampler, and it, it takes DNA samples as well. And Julie may talk to you a little bit about that. Okay, here is what, there's the caldera. You see the edge of the caldera that I showed you earlier. We had a workshop to talk about what was going to happen. Uh, we had the workshop in April 2022 because Scott and his colleague Bill Chadwick, who's still at sea, for, uh, had predicted, having looked at the rate of inflation of the floor, they'd predicted that something was going to happen. That's Scott's story, but it, it was very exciting. It was enough, exciting enough so that I sent out something like 100 invitations to people to come to Seattle on this date to talk about, well, what would we do if it ever erupted? Yeah. It, that workshop was called Wired and Restless, and we got a few people we didn't expect, but most of them were sensible scientists. And this is what William Wilcock did. He emailed us two days after the workshop was over. He emailed us and said, I, I think something's going on. He, he, he clearly had been tracking the earthquakes, and that's his story. But it's very, very exciting that it, in, in, within minutes of the activity picking up, William was on, on top of it and was communicating with us. So here's another bottom pressure tilt. That's a close-up picture. We figured I had to show you at least one instrument. And this is part of, this is part of Scott's story. The seafloor was at this depth for a while, 
And just during the time that William was watching the earthquakes, the bottom dropped out for a, about 2.4 meters, and that was the new position of the seafloor. And then at the same time, the water inside the caldera heated up. Now, those stories are, you're going to get more detail on those stories from these folks. Can we turn the sound up just a little bit? This is something we didn't expect, nor did we understand what it was. These are not earthquakes. And I'm going to let William talk to you about what they have determined that they were, and then uh, we'll discuss what difference it made when we got out there to look at this. There were folks, folks like uh, Deb Kelly, uh, Chadwick, uh, Nooner, uh, Julie and her colleagues uh, all were involved in a cruise three months after the fact and they found some interesting results. So I have to escape this here very carefully here. And this I just wanted to show you. Keep, keep an eye on this furry little beast here. This is called the hors d'oeuvre. Tube worms don't taste very good to us, but I don't know if you just saw what it did. It just fed itself. I'm going to show that to you again. These are the kinds of things that stream back along the cable. We can get that kind of resolution. Those were very, very high resolution HD video coming down the fiber. It's really exciting. My bottom line is this. These events that we have seen offshore signal a new era in the ocean sciences as instantaneous internet access to complex events offshore will enable interactive, meaning we can see things going on and we can interact with them in real time as we respond to complex energetic processes throughout the entire volume of the ocean. That's the key point. That's the big news. This, what we have just done, what these folks are going to talk to you about scientifically, is the very exciting first step in this, this arena. Scott? Okay, I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the surface deformation that we've observed at axial seamount and how that led us to uh, forecasting the, er the eruption. And then I'll show a little bit about uh, some of the results from our recent cruise mapping lava flows. So what, I'm, what this is showing you is um, a history of the surface elevation of the center of the caldera at axial seamount starting in uh, 1997. And so what, what this is showing is that the, the surface of the volcano has been moving up and down uh, over that time period. And what's going on is that the, uh, the magma chamber underlying the volcano is continually having magma fed to it from, uh, from below, from the mantle. And as that happens, the volcano's pressure within the magma chamber builds and the whole system swells like a balloon. And so that causes the surface of the volcano to, to rise. And then once the, uh, the pressure within the magma chamber gets to a certain level, an eruption occurs and magma drains out and that results in a rapid uh, fall of the, of the caldera surface. So that's what we're seeing here. So the first one that we observed was in 1998. You can see this huge drop in the elevation of the center of the caldera there. It was close to three and a half meters of, of, uh, of drop. And then subsequently, there was a pretty long period of inflation that started pretty rapidly and then slowed down over time until 2011 when another eruption occurred. And you can see that on this figure as well. So we, after collecting this long time series of data, and we have this data not just from this one point, but we have data like this from several points over the volcano. Um, we built, we hypothesized that the, the volcano behaved in a relatively simple way over short time periods so that we could actually forecast what was going on. So the idea is essentially that as the magma chamber pressure reaches a certain level, 
it exceeds a, a critical threshold that triggers an eruption. And that can be seen on the surface by the uh, elevation of the surface, because the elevation of the surface is essentially a mirror of what's going on down below. So it's telling us what's happening with the magmatic system at depth. So this is a, and that, that's why this is such an important tool, is this gives us a way to look at the, the dynamics of the, the movement of magma below the surface over time. And so based on this simple model, uh, and you can see the, in the threshold that I've drawn on this chart here, we, uh, in 2014, sort of mid-2014, we started suggesting that we, we think that, that we thought that there would be an eruption in 2015 at some point. And then as, and, but you have to remember what was going on at this time is that we would go out every year or two and pick up instruments that we had left on the bottom and uh, make new measurements, put new instruments down, and then we wouldn't get any data back for a few years. So we, uh, you can see at this, at this time, before the eruption occurred, the last time we had been there was 2013. So we were making this, an, this guess initially uh, based on our last measurements in 2013. So this was a, a year prior uh, when we had last been there. Um, and then just prior to that workshop that John was talking about, the, we had some data start streaming in which corro corroborated uh, what we thought was going on, which was that the volcano was continuing to inflate at this rapid rate. So we said at the workshop that we definitely th thought the, an eruption was imminent, and two days later it happened, so it was. So this was our uh, eruption uh, window based on what we were observing. Now the cool thing was, um, because the data at that point was streaming in, we were able to, to see how the surface was moving uh, during the eruption, and then after the eruption as well. And, and that's been a pretty uh, interesting thing to, to continue to look at. So you can see now, this is where the eruption occurred, and then subsequent inflation. So here we are, this shows about where we are now. Currently, the volcano is inflating at a very rapid rate, at about an average of 80 centimeters per year, and it doesn't, it has shown some signs of slowing down, but then it speeds back up. So it's continuing on at about that same rate, if you average over the last several weeks. Um, and if it continues to go at that same rate, which is very fast, 80 centimeters per year, if you look at the inflation rate between the 2011 and 2015 eruptions, the average inflation rate was about 60 centimeters per year. So this is very fast. And if it continues to go at that rate, the volcano will be back in the same position that it was in 2015, essentially. So in two years from now, we may be in a position, the, or the volcano may be in a position that it's, it's uh, about to erupt again. Now, that's not a guarantee at all, because as you can see between the 1998 eruption and the 2011 eruption, the, the rate at which inflation occurs can change. There was a long period of time before, before the 2011 eruption where the inflation rate was much lower. But the great thing is now we have these cabled instruments that allow us to see at least in a few uh, locations, and the Caldera Center is one of those locations, uh, what, what's happening in real time. So that's five minutes already? Goes by fast. I'm fascinated. Keep going. <laughs> All right. So let me just quickly. The w the way we do this is um, there. Typically on land, you use uh, satellites to, like for GPS, to track the surface motions. On the sea floor, we have to come up with some other way to do it. So we use pressure measurements, and basically what we're measuring is the height of the water column above the, the sea, sea floor. And as the volcano, right, the elevation changes, goes, ups and down, goes up and down, the uh, water column above gets shorter or taller, and so the corresponding pressure 
does the same thing. So that's the idea of how we do it. And this is an example of some of our battery-powered uh, bottom pressure recorders and some, we, ha we make ROV-based measurements as well on top of benchmarks. And then we have the, the ones that are connected to the cable now. And this shows all of these dots is a spot where we have an instrument or uh, a benchmark where we make these pressure measurements. So we have a pretty good array of these at this point. Um, and do I have time to talk about lava flows at all? Absolutely. OK. So I'm just going to briefly talk about the lava flow mapping and describe how we do that. Uh, the way that we've been able to track where the, the lava flows occur during the uh, eruptions that we've witnessed are by bathymetry dif differencing. So we uh, make maps of the, the seafloor and then subtract the previous map from the current map. And if they're high enough resolution, then we can actually make out very small changes caused by new lava flows. And so that's what we've done. And we did that in uh, a cruise that we just went out on in August using the AUV Sentry. Previously, this has been done using Imbari AUVs, the D. Allen B. Um, and so here's an example of the 2011 lava flow outline uh, that was determined this way, the 1998 lava flow, which is in white, and then the most recent 2015 lava flow, which is uh, these pink blobs. So you can see that. One, one thing that stands out is the 2015 eruption went along the north rift zone rather than the south, south rift zone. Um, but historically, most eruptions have occurred on the, the southern end, which is why you don't see the, the caldera wall on the southern end. It's been covered over by lava flows. And here's just an example from uh, the 2011 eruption. You can see the, the pre-2011 high resolution map, bathymetry map post-2011 high-res bathymetry map. And by subtracting the two, you, the, uh, the, the new lava flow outline pops out. It's very easy to see. And so this, this is incredible, actually. And so we've done the same thing with the, uh, with the most recent eruption. And here's an example within the caldera of what that looks like. Now this time, this is differencing bathymetry maps collected from uh, two different vehicles, but we can still do that. Okay, so that's all I have. I'll turn it over to William. So um, geophysicists on land take it pretty much for granted that if they're working in a sort of active area where there's earthquakes, volcanoes, that they will deploy dense networks of seismometers in conjunction with geodetic instrumentation. So they can both measure earthquakes and see the deformation of the earth that leads to those earthquakes and occurs during them. And that's something that's extremely hard to do in the oceans um, with autonomous instruments because you need to deploy them for long time scales and you need to coordinate it between multiple different kinds of instruments. So the Ocean Observatory Initiative um, network at Axial Seamount basically for the first time gives us the ability to make sustained long-term seismic and geodetic observations on the timescales that are required. And my interest is a seismologist of the seismometers and axial seamount, um, and this is a map that John showed earlier just of the caldera. Basically, the southern half of the caldera is instrumented and there are a total of seven seismometers there. So that's a small but sufficient network to monitor the seismicity associated with um, the crest of the volcano. And one of the really neat things about the um, cabled array is the instruments are very high quality and therefore the data is very high quality. And rather than show you a lot of wiggles of seismograms, I thought I'd just show you one of the instruments. And this is the actual seismometer itself. And then this is the, what basically connects it to the cable. And there's a plate here with three points of contact and two leveling screws. So the ROV went down and carefully leveled this instrument. So the seismometer is fully leveled. They oriented it so it's pointing north-south, so it's just like a land installation of an instrument. And the data from the seismic network started streaming about a year ago, and there was some initial engineering work, and by the end of January, the timing and data gap problems were sorted out, and we've had data since then. And we've recorded about 100,000 earthquakes, so it's very, actually has been very seismically active. 
And this is an animation that I'm going to play, um, which is going to start basically in January. So the date's up here, so we're now in January. And this is showing all the earthquakes, the outline of the is around here. This is the lava flow, or one of the lava flows in 2015, this is 2011. And you can see the seismic activity is slowly building up, and it's sort of pulsed. And that's because as the volcano is inflating, the sort of walls of the caldera are, are creaking, and the floor of the caldera is lifting up. But it's also modulated by the tides. The ocean sea surface is going up, by, up and down by several um, meters. And basically, when you have low tides, you sort of relieve the pressures, and so it can creak a little more. So it's a bit like a sort of old, a wooden ship um, in the ocean. And we're now going just to see the eruption now. That's the eruption when everything went red. And now it's pretty much after that, the seismicity's continued, but it's not as active. And so that's one of the discoveries. And what we really want to do is to get this working in real time so that we can have locations basically in real time so that people, not just me, but other people can see um, what the volcano is doing. Um, this is another animation. Another thing that we discovered after the volcano erupted where there were also these signals that John showed that went through the water column. So rather than seeing se seismic signals that go through the Earth, there were acoustic signals that went through the water column. And they were from explosions that are small explosions, impulsive sources that occurred on the sea floor. And then we saw wa um, waves that basically echoed up and down in the water column until they were recorded by hydrophones or seismometers. And this is an animation which shows um, a subset of the earthquakes. And this is just showing this is now is in April. And now that was the eruption, and then these are the explosive sources. They're all located about 20 kilometers to the north. Um, and we discovered these within a few days. They started basically within a few hours of the onset of the eruption. They were very visible a couple of days later, and they continued for about a month. And then they continued, so this, and these are related to erupting lavas on the sea floor. They're prob we don't, there's some different ideas of what might what be causing them, but they could be basically degassing of the magma and small explosions on the sea floor. Well, based on this, um, the, the first cruise to go out there was um, the OOI maintenance cruise with Deb Kelly, the chief scientist. And they went and mapped in the area where you've seen these explosions. And this is one of these difference maps that um, Scott was describing. And so these, these areas and colors are regions where, between 2013 and 2015, the sea floor had basically elevated. And they discovered very, very thick lava flows in two locations. And this, this is a great slide that Debbie Kelly made, showing basically it was what the thickness of the lava is, about 120 meters, 400 feet. So a very substantial lava flow on the sea floor. Um, that they, on the OI maintenance crews, they were able to dive and have one dive on this and squeeze this in. Their main objective was to maintain the instruments, but they went there. And this is just a movie which shows this. And so you can see the old lava here and then the new lava in the contact. And now we're moving up the lava flow. Um, this is a pillow lava, um, a sort of a bubble of lava, which is emptied out. And that may have been you know, gas driving that in one of these sources. Um, there's still heat coming out of this, so it's hydrothermally and biologically active. And Julie can tell you more about what this is showing. Um, measured temperatures of 17 degrees. This is several months after the eruption. Um, and there are also drain back features on the lava where basically an inflated and molten lava and float, float away beneath that. Um, and so that's everything I have to say, so I'll pass it over to Julia. All right, now for something a little bit different. Oh, that didn't work out. Uh, so I've been studying the microbes at Axial for the last 15 years since the first eruption in 1998. And what I wanted to briefly do is give you a perspective um, from a biologist of what these eruptions mean for life at Axial. And uh, most recently, I teamed up with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to support some research really focusing on, on sub-seafloor life at Axial, so life beneath the seafloor. Um, and the collaborators are listed there, and we've been doing much of our at-sea work in collaboration, both with OOI, but in particular with Scott and Bill Chadwick, because in fact, what's happening in terms of seismicity and earthquakes is really important for microbes. 
So in 2015, with some supplemental funding from the NSF, we went out to up to this northern rift zone, um, again, to look for these eruptive lavas and new venting. Um, and shown here are just some of the things we found up there. Um, you remember, we're, we were only there about three months afterwards, and we were already seeing a new colonization by these vent endemic fauna like tube worms. And up in these really thick areas that William was just showing video of, where there's still warm fluids leaking out, we were able to uh, culture high temperature organisms or grow them in our laboratory. These vents did not exist prior to the eruption, yet as soon as the eruption occurred and flushed out the subsea floor, we were able to sample these fluids and grow these organisms in the lab. On the cooler lavas, where there wasn't this thick microbial mat, we were not able to do that. So the re reason eruptions are so interesting from my perspective is because they provide an access point to this really important habitat on our planet that we have a lot of trouble studying, and that is the subsea floor. So life within the rocks and fluids that make up 70% of our planet's surface. It's really a hard place to study. You often have to drill to get to it. But in these eruptive events, the fluids that are carrying these microbes and their energy sources are brought to the surface naturally. Now, we've seen this happen three times at Axial now in 2011, in 1998, and 2015. And in every case, we see things like this. We see a lot of new production of microbial biomass that we believe is being fed by the chemical energy sources that are being brought to the surface um, by the eruptive process. And these microbes are pretty interesting. All of my slides are... <laughs> all wacky. So um, in this instance, as I mentioned, we are able to culture these high temperature organisms from these new venting fluids. And this was worked by my colleague, Jim Holden. These are all methanogens. This is, these are organisms that belong to a group called the archaea. And they use hydrogen and carbon dioxide to make methane. That's all they need to grow. They hate oxygen. Um, they grow at temperatures up to about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are organisms that are living beneath the sea floor and they're being brought out into the surface and we're capturing them in those fluids and growing them. In previous years, we've also grown microbes like this, who again are using chemical energy from the hydrothermal system, like hydrogen and sulfur, uh, to grow and make sulfide in these case. Now these organisms are pretty remarkable because they're living completely away from the photosynthetic world that we're also familiar with. Oxygen rich, carbon rich, light rich. And of course, the discovery of organisms like these has really brought to the forefront the idea that this might be the type of life we want to look for outside of our own uh, planet. And I've shown three examples here that you've probably been hearing a lot about at this conference, including Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, uh, Europa, the moon of Jupiter, and of course, Mars, where we know there is now liquid water still on the surface. These two moons, we believe, have uh, salty oceans or oceans of some sort beneath their icy shell. So whether or not we'll find life on these remain to be known, but certainly studying these really exotic organisms found on our own planet um, are a great model for understanding life beyond beyond sort of that fanciful or you know really understanding basic earth processes, the organisms from these environments have attracted a myriad of scientists who are interested in them for a lot of different reasons. And I've just put a few examples up here. This includes kind of modifying their genetic code and how things are ordered so they can produce useful things like industrial chemicals or biofuels. And that's because up here, most of the biofuel industry is driven, uh, is focusing right now on organisms that require sunlight to grow, cyanobacteria and algae. These organisms that I'm talking about can be grown underground. They simply need hydrogen, CO2, a few trace elements, and they can grow. So there have been some successful examples in the last couple of years where scientists have uh, tweaked how their genes are, are, are uh, lined up and been able to produce these important industrial chemicals or biofuels. Recently, there was an isolation of an organism that actually is carrying an antibacterial gene inside of it, but it's actually in an archaea. And that's the first example of an archaea, which is a completely different domain of life that has this antibacterial activity. Now, we all use antibacterial drugs when we get an ear infection or when we're sick, and this provides a potentially a new route for understanding how we can fight some of the superbugs that we're being faced with. 
And finally, people are interested in sort of exploiting the natural diversity of organisms we find, searching for anti-cancer products, other natural products, similar to the type of research going on um, in coral reefs or the uh, tropical rainforests. Now, one of the big disadvantages compared to what you just heard about is the instruments uh, that we have ready right now to go on a cable do not provide the kind of real-time resolution data that both William and Scott just showed you. The time scale for studying biology and getting an answer is very different because the methods and tools are very different. That doesn't mean it is, it's impossible. So uh, John mentioned the sampler that's already down on Axial, the, uh, the RAS sampler, and what it does is either on a pre-programmed scale or being triggered from control room on land, can take in some vent fluid, filter it, and fix it on the seafloor. And so this unit was deployed in 2014, 2015. It's shown over here, along with the in-situ mass spec. Um, we have those samples in my lab. We're analyzing them by we're sequencing the DNA that we're finding in those samples, and that data will hopefully be publicly available um, early in 2016. And in the future, we hope that we'll be able to have all the data coming back at the same time so we can trigger it to take samples in response to an eruption or some other event. However, even that's a little bit um, underwhelming from my perspective because it's a passive monitoring of what's happening. And what I would like to be able to do is get um, experimental on the seafloor in a more interactive uh, way. And so what I've been doing, again, with the Moore Foundation is trying to develop um, an instrument that could potentially go on the cable one day that will allow us not only to monitor what's happening, but also to interact and do experiments in real time based on all the other data that we're getting. If the seismicity starts to increase, if the temperature is changing, if the turbidity of the water is changing, so we've tested this instrument a couple of times using power from a remotely operated vehicle where we can take in samples, we can add in a tracer, we can heat it up, um, and then we can kill the experiment, stop it, bring those samples back on shore and analyze them. And my future vision is to get it on this cable to really do these interactive experiments um, to help us really understand what these microbes are doing, not just once a year or not just a few months after an eruption, um, but in these real-time um, settings. So maybe in five, 10 years, I'll be back here and, and can tell you more about that. So back to you, John. I would like to reiterate what I alluded to in the beginning, that, that in my view this is the early stage of a fundamental shift in our ability to work the oceans throughout the volume of the oceans without having to be there. It's just early stages, but within literally months, live HD video will be able to be streamed through the internet into classrooms, living rooms, laboratories. Nancy? Great. We'll now open the floor for questions. Absolutely. We hope for them. Are there any questions from reporters in the audience? Just a reminder that only reporters may ask questions. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, Mary Miller, Exploratorium. So I look at that uh, graph of a 1998 eruption and 2011, uh, 2015, and I wonder if anybody can speculate about that uh, frequency. Like, should we be concerned that we're having more frequent uh, events now, and what is the possibility that this might indicate perhaps something that we on land should be concerned about with Cascadia or events that might might be of concern to us? Use your microphone. Yeah, I think we're seeing just uh, some of the natural variability in the volcanic system. Each of the more recent eruptions has been uh, significantly smaller in terms of the amount of magma removed from the, the volcano's magma chamber than the 1998 one. So if we, if another eruption that large occurs next time, then it would be even longer until the following one as the, that magma chamber recharges. So I, I think it's just part of the natural variability. I don't think there's anything we need to be concerned about. We need to worry about magnitude nine earthquakes before we worry about uh, underwater volcanoes doing harm to humans. Are there any other questions there? <coughs> um, I'm Rachel Berkowitz, and I'm with Physics Today. Rachel. Hi. And I was wondering, do you have any data about the geochemistry of the magma that's, or the crystal content of the magma that's erupted in the most recent one and in the previous ones, and if you 
have that or if you plan to get that, if you've worked out any information about the depth of the chambers that are feeding the eruption? It's <clears throat> a little difficult to invert directly the chemistry of the lavas with the depth of the magma chamber, but yes, we've taken a number of samples, both, both groups that went out, Julie and her team uh, Scott, or, uh, with Scott and, and Bill Chadwick took samples, and Deb Kelly with the, uh, the operations and maintenance crews for the cabled observatory also took samples. Uh, the analyses, I think, are going on right now. There may be some preliminary information available here, but I can certainly put you in touch, Rachel, with uh, the folks who have studied the previous eruptions and the ones that are studying the, the lava now. I, that, Pardon? Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, they're basalts. They're, they're tholeitic basalts. Okay. Uh, how much do you know about basalt? Um, more than I should, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they have a fairly low alkaline content. Uh, they are not, uh, we think, they're not particularly volatile rich uh, by comparison to other kinds of volcanoes that do erupt. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that they trap in the bubbles and in the glass itself, they trap a significant amount of gas. And the gas that comes out of the volcano leads to a story that feeds the microbes that Julia is interested in. So this is an entire ecosystem that is driven by volcanic activity. Things like this have been going on for at least four, three and a half to four billion years. And it, many people speculate that life may have originated in, at the interface between underwater magma systems and the overlying ocean. So that it's, it's very exciting science. It, and Julie's allusion uh, to the potential of using what we learn in our ability to work routinely in our own ocean to export to other planets when we go to planets that have oceans like Europa, possibly Enceladus. Those are, those are very, very exciting potentials. Longer term, and the, uh, the point that she mentioned about uh, pharmaceuticals and biotech, the, the opportunities are, are huge. I, I'm very, very excited about the work she and her colleagues are doing. Nance? Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Lee, are there any other, other questions on the chat? Uh, let me just say one more thing, then, and that is that with the, with the Paris meeting and climate change on the horizon of almost everybody at, at, or on the radar screen of almost everybody. It's important for all of us to remember that basically the ocean is the engine that drives basically long-term weather as well as short-term and long-term climate. But we don't understand the ocean very well. It's an unbelievably complex system. And so the only way many of us think we are ever going to fully understand the system that we depend upon human life and all other forms of life on the planet depend on the ocean as our life support system. The only way to understand that is to study them from within. And what fiber optic cables give us is a presence throughout entire volumes of the ocean whereby we can run experiments. Many of you probably remember what happened on 9-11, but do you remember what happened on 9-7? Some doctors in New York City removed the gallbladder of a woman who was physically in France. That was 15 years ago. If that could happen then, imagine the kinds of things we can do with remote robotic capabilities in our own ocean to begin understanding this system. It's really very, very exciting. We're going to be available. Or can, I, can I ask if there are other folks who have background in this field, would you put your hands up in case there are folks who want to add, ask questions? I, I'm sorry, I can't see you folks. <laughs> ah. So if those of you that are interested in uh, uh, maybe from the fourth estate, if you're interested in what are, I don't know what we are, we're the sixth flank, <laughs> I guess. But uh, look around and, and many of these folks would be happy to talk to you. Great. All right. Well, if there are no more questions from the, uh, any reporters? Okay. Great. Okay. That concludes our press conference. Thank you very much. Mm. Our next uh, event will be a press workshop at 4 o'clock on the Carbon Mineral Challenge, a worldwide hunt for new carbon minerals. Thank you.